Good morning. Today we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11. If you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. Dear, any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge and aid the angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you not appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brothers go to law against brothers, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Lord's Word. And we're continuing our Sunday morning study of the, the New Testament Epistle of Paul, 1 Corinthians. And so today we look at these 11 verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As each of us grow into life and to adulthood, I'm persuaded that each of us, and I say this statement based upon conversation with so many, looking at my own life, observation of life in general, and even in counseling sessions, I'm persuaded to say that each of us have a tendency to struggle with a particular sin area. I think about Hebrews chapter 12 where the writer of Hebrews says, there's a sin that easily entangles. You may have heard it described as the besetting sin. In verse 9 and 10 that Thomas just read here in this particular chapter, there's a, there's a list of such sins that so many people struggle with. Um, sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, homosexuality, stealing, greed, drunkenness, reveling or reviling, swindling. And of course, we would say that there's these sins, they're not a struggle for the, for the believer, but they are, they're not, they are not for an unbeliever. It's their common practice to practice out these particular sins. But all of us have been there in one form of another. Amen? We all have. And if you say you haven't, then you can add pride to that list. <laughs> because pride is really at the root of all sin. Glorious good news, though, of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that while each of us have sin, we no longer have to practice or be under the power of sin. And that's why Paul says in verse 11 there, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that's good news. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 8, if the Son sets you free, you are what? Free. Amen. You are free indeed. What a glorious truth of the gospel. We need to be reminded of this glorious truth that you are free. You're free from the penalty of sin. And in Christ, you're free from the power of sin. I think about the circus ringmaster. He ties a rope to the baby elephant's leg. And he ties the other end of the rope to the stake in the ground. And he's doing so he can train that elephant when it's little to stay put, don't move. And as that elephant gets older, he no longer even has to tie the rope to the stake. And even though that elephant is big in power and can do anything that it wanted to, 
it stays because it's been trained that way. And that's what sin does to us. Even when you come to faith in Christ, sometimes you remember the old life, the old nature, and maybe you hear the voice of the old evil one, and, and you don't understand the power and the freedom that you have in Christ. So those sins still crop up. Now this is the great truth that I believe that Paul is trying to get across here at the Corinthian church, that you no longer have to live this way, think this way, Act this way because things are different now. Things have changed. And as we've seen in our Sunday morning study in the Corinthian church, that was a struggling church. And namely, as we've said already, the root sin was pride. And this pride has been working itself out in a variety of ways to this chapter. It worked itself out earlier in divisions in the church. The church was a divided church. Last week we saw a terrible, a terrible chapter about sexual immorality in the church. We could say it was a disgraced church. And then we come to chapter 6 and it was a disputing church. Look with me in verse 1. Paul says here in, I guess I need to go from 2 Corinthians to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, when one of you have a grievance against another... Does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? And that word grievance there, your Bible may interpret that as a, as a case or a dispute. And I want you to notice something. Paul doesn't say if a grievance comes up, but when a grievance comes up. And this may surprise you, and I don't want anyone to pass out in disbelief. But if you've been a part of a church fellowship or family for any given length of time, you will experience a grievance. Either you've had a grievance towards another, or you are on the receiving end of grievance from another. And that shouldn't be surprising. It really shouldn't. Every family has grievances. Uh, the Martin family, we have disputes at times. Can you believe that? <laughs> and maybe yours does. And the church is a family, so grievances, disputes happen within the family. And the question then becomes, well, how do you handle it? Because it will come. Now some Christians say, well, I, I'm just not going to go back to that church. I'm going to stay at home with my three friends, me, myself, and I. <laughs> just stay there. But the Bible doesn't give that as an option. And so we need to look into Scripture and listen with listening ears what Paul would say to us when we encounter grievances within the family of God and in the local church. Now the Corinthian response to grievances was to what? Just sue you. I'll take, let's just take it to court. And this was a cultural influence from the Greeks upon the church. It wasn't really a Jewish one. Because the Jews literally forbid going to a Gentile court to settle disputes. They settled it among the Jewish elders. They settled it within the family. But the Corinthian culture influenced so much from around it, uh, we just take people to court. Everybody was an amateur lawyer. And they, they would say, well, I have rights, and you have wronged me, and so therefore I'm suing. And so what would happen in that culture in the first century, the, a lot of times the wealthier Christians, they had more clout locally in the social standing, maybe with money, and they could rule over the poorer Christians within the fellowship. And this was happening in the Corinthian church. Now, American culture is quite similar to the Corinthian culture in this context of, of lawsuits. I was just reading recently that over one million lawsuits are filed in the United States every single month. Can you imagine that? One of the most popular TV shows is Judge Judy. <laughs> okay, and so you know it's popular. Now it's one thing for unbelievers to respond this way, but it's tragic for Christians within the church. Christians were filing suit against other Christians within the church just simply because of a grievance within the body. Now this grievance was probably related to money or property, and we can say that probably because based upon in verse 7, Paul asked the correct question to the Corinthians, why not just be defrauded or robbed or cheated? I think it goes without saying that Paul was not against or critical against all court cases. Obviously there were criminal cases, child abuse cases and such that need to be handled by the governing authorities. And Romans 13 teaches that we are to respect the governing authorities. 
So there's some things even in America that will be handled by the state and federal authorities. But Paul's point is that disputes between Christians over money, property, and other grievances must not be taken to the secular court. And so we need to pause here and we need to ask the question here, why? Why is Paul so adamant that this must not take place? And I think he gives us three reasons. You might make note of these this morning. The first thing that he says in verses 2 through 4 is the position of the saints. He says, or do you not know, in verse 2, that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? And so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Now, there is so much that we don't understand the depth of what we just read. We're, we're going to judge the world as Christians. And one day when the Lord returns, we're going to judge angels. That probably is referring to the fallen angels of time past. But nevertheless, can anybody plumb the depths of that statement? What an amazing thought. But it's taught throughout Scripture. Paul just didn't go off on a tangent here. This is a common thought, right? Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 29 and 30. Why don't you read this with me? Uh, Jesus said, I sign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom. Read it with me. That you may eat and drink at my table. And one more verse I would share is Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Read this with me. The one who conquers, I will grant you to sit as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. But what a glorious, glorious thought of a position of the saints. And so Paul's point is clear that if we're going to judge one day such mighty, weighty, important matters, Paul says, is, are, you, are you not capable? Are you so incompetent that you cannot judge less important matters? Now, Paul says in verse 4 that secular judges and juries, they have no standing in the church. That is, they have no really understanding of eternal matters or spiritual matters. And so, therefore, they don't have authority to deal with disputes within the body of Christ. Okay? So, the first thing that Paul is saying is the position of the saints. That's why you don't need to go to the courts. But he gives a second reason in verses 5 and 6, and that is the power of shame. Notice what he says. I will say this to your shame. Can it be there that no one among you is wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? The brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. <coughs> Now, Paul's emphasis, I want you to note that last phrase, and that before unbelievers. What, what do you think unbelievers think when they hear about Christians arguing and questioning and splitting and disassociating and taking each other to court? Do you think they have a thought about that? And I would suspect the thought is, is well, I'm not part of any of that. Why would, why would I, why would my family need any of that? You see, when you look into the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, the distinguishing mark of a church is to be one of love, right? And, and that's what Paul said in Romans 12, 10. He says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That should be our desire as a church, that we just outdo one another in showing affection and love. And then listen to the words of Christ in John 13, 35. He says, By this all people, the world, will know that you are my disciples if you have what? You have love for one another. What a great part of the evangelism and the witness of the church is our love deeply for one another. So the second reason here is the power of shame. We shouldn't go to the courts. Number one is the position of the saints. But then third and last is the profit of surrender. 
Now notice what he says in verse 7. He says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And so what Paul is saying there, beginning of verse 7, when a Christian, even if they win the lawsuit, do they really win? Paul says, no, you've already experienced defeat. Hey, have you ever heard the saying, you can win the battle, but you lose the war? <laughs> I mean, you know how it's like when you win an argument with your wife, you don't win. <laughs> it's the same principle. And, that, and that's what Paul is saying here. Go win your lawsuit. You really lose. Go be right in your grievance or your dispute, whatever it may be. In the end, sometimes it's just not worth it. Now, are there some things worth fighting for in the, in the Christian life? Yeah, there is. That's why Jude wrote the book and he says, contend for the faith, strive. We should be wary. And there are those areas of doctrinal faith that are central to our faith. The person of Christ, his divinity, our salvation, and things of that nature. We contend. But my observation in the pastor over 15 to 20 years is that that's rarely the case for disputes. <laughs> It's so often secondary and third issues. We have to use wisdom when we know when to fight, contend, or dispute. We need to have maybe godly counsel of others to help us think through this. And sometimes the godly counsel of others say, just pull back. Wait on that. Don't see that email just yet. Wait it out. Pray about it. And if Paul's saying here, or he's not really saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with what's happening in your situation. Paul's not necessarily saying you're just making a mountain out of a molehill. It can truly be a mountain. But what he's saying in verse 7, sometimes there is just a time where you have to suffer wrong and, or, or be cheated or defrauded. Verse 8, he says, but you yourselves wrong and defraud. It goes both ways, right? And you do this even to your own brothers. There's just times in the Christian life we give it to Jesus. We stop holding on. Stop simmering. He's saying there are times that when a dispute between Christians gets so big and it spills over into the public arena to the outsiders, then what a prime time does it step back and let it go? Now here's the question I'm going to ask you. You think through that because you probably think you just don't know what they did, Jill. <laughs> You just don't know what they said. No, I don't. No, I don't. But God does. And do you think God can take care of you in your situation? Can God appropriately administer justice in His timing one day? He can. And can God restore to you what was taken from you? Oh, yes, He can. And I want you to remember one other thought as you think about this. Remember that the one that you are disputing with in the local church is not an enemy. It's a brother. It's a sister in Jesus Christ. The story is told about a little girl who was walking down the street. She was carrying a heavy baby. She was laboring, but she was doing it. A man walked to her and said to her, Is that baby not too heavy for you? And she said, Oh, no, he's my brother. The relationship makes all the difference in the world. So it is in the family of God. Now, let's think about this as we summarize this this morning. Why not bring the grievances to the courts? Number one, the position of the saints. You're going to one day judge the world and, and judge angels. And so there's people within the body of Christ to help settle disputes, right? Number two is the power of shame. It's a terrible witness to the lost world when Christians bigger. And then number three, the prophet of surrender. If it's not settled appropriately within the brothers within the church, as according to maybe Matthew 18, for example, then there's just a wise time you just let it go and give it to the Lord. Now remember how we started this message this morning. Started by saying that when you get saved, everything radically changes. And this is a context of something that radically changes. How I view grievances with one another. That totally turns upside down to the old flesh nature. And everything in your past, sinful tendencies, your temperament, 
how you were taught, how you were raised, everything is laid at the feet of Jesus Christ, right? We lay everything. Everything's on the table. We have to be. And remember, we're not perfect. You and I, I'm not perfect. And we're still going to struggle at times with different sinful tendencies and areas. We have to remember the glorious truth that we no longer practice our sin. It may entangle us. We still hate it, but we're not under its power. And we're not under its penalty. That's what Paul said, and I believe in verse 9 and 10. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. That phrase, do not be deceived, is interesting. You can be, you can be tricked. You can, you, you, and this has happened so often in American Christianity. You, you, you know, they say, you believe in God, believe in Jesus, now go live the way you want to, and one day you'll go to heaven. And that's a deception. And Paul makes that clear. Because he says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolatries, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He doesn't make that statement wishy-washy. He says it's very clear. These are those that would practice this sin, practice it, and not hate the sin, but just indulge in it. Now, is it possible that Christians can partake of some of those sins? I believe so. They will hate the sin, and they will be miserable. And there will be a desire in their heart to love God more and hate the sin more and turn to God. There's going to be a change, and that's what Paul is saying. And Paul is saying in verse 11, but you're no longer like this. And that's why he says, and were such were some of you. It was your past. And he says, but. And that's a good word, right? But. You were washed. Oh, that means all of your past sins, all of the guilt, all of the shame, washed away. There is not one sin that can keep you from coming and experiencing the grace of God. That's good news. And then the next thing he says is that you are sanctified. You were set apart for God for now a change of living, a new way of living, set apart by God. And you were justified. It is a new standing. You have as a Christian a new standing before God. Before, before God's holy law, you were guilty. Now in Christ, you are innocent. You are not guilty. You have a new standing. You're justified. God now sees you as a Christian just as if you had never sinned. Amen. And how is this all possible? Well, well, it's possible by the Lord Jesus Christ. The change takes place. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What a glorious verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? The old has passed away. And behold... The new has come. So the proof of Christianity, dear friend, is not so much your talk, but your walk. The true mark of the Christian is not holding a sign that says turn or burn. <laughs> the mark of a true Christian is not having a bumper sticker that says honk if you love Jesus. The mark of a Christian is there's been a change. A changed life. And how does it occur? It occurs not by self-help books, not by turning over a new leaf, not trying to make a new commitment, not trying to find another church, not finding a new relationship. It's not found by changing jobs, moving to a new location, not by winning the lottery or getting a promotion and a raise that comes into the new job. It's none of those things. Those things have their place, perhaps, in timing. But those things don't make a change and give you a new life from the inside out. How does it happen? The last part of verse 11, the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's how it takes place. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? We're going to have an invitation song. We're going to sing just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. If you come to a place in your life where you had no plea, no defense. You knew you had sinned before a holy God, a good God, a great God. And that one day you're going to be judged eternally. But you need a Savior. You need something. You need God to change you. 
And dear friend, it's through Jesus Christ. If you ever had a life-changing experience through Jesus Christ, I'm not talking that you have some head knowledge. But if you confessed your sins to God and believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can do so right now where you're seated. You can do that. Oh, Father, your will be done in this invitation. As our elder couples come right now and we stand, Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this invitation time. Move the people's hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as I am.
But it is an opportunity to come and pray and publicly share that God's moving at that time. Well, this is a public testimony that we're going to have right now with the baptism. And uh, Rick, why don't you share a word about this? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be baptizing a young girl by the name of Nicole Botts. And I have known uh, Matt and Cindy for a long time. I love this family. Just love them. And they uh, have a daughter who has decided, I want to be baptized. You know how does my kid comes up and says, I want to be baptized? Like, yeah. And she says it again. And this girl is persistent. I love talking to her because she says, I want to know God better, and I want to be baptized. And it's really an honor because they asked me to. This family came to my home for a Bible study many years ago, back when I still had eyes, I could see, and hair, and all that really fun stuff that I don't have anymore. But anyhow, she wants to come and make a confession of faith to a baptism. So we're going to do that now. Yes.